Musical Talk, the UK independent musical theatre podcast. Musical Talk listeners, it's Mike Shapiro here with another installment of our coverage of Edinburgh Fringe 2018. One of the things I like about Edinburgh musical theater, speaking wise, is the abundance of shows on historical topics. There's something very appealing about an earnest delve into history to tell the story of an exemplary soul or perhaps a cautionary tale about someone gone wrong. If the show is biographically inspired rather than strictly fictional, it faces two challenges. One, finding a real-life person whose life makes a satisfying narrative, and two, selecting excerpts from that life to make a story that can be told in an hour or two. The musical I'm going to discuss today, A Gallant Life, succeeds on both fronts. It's about Muriel Thompson, a very interesting figure who started her life as a champion race car driver in the first years of the 20th century, then went on to be a heroic ambulance and convoy driver in World War I, both impressive acts in their own right, but doubly so for a woman in that time period. A Gallant Life was written and directed by Kate Stevenson, who, in addition to being a skilled dramatist, is also a professional educator. I was so impressed by this show that I tracked down Kate during the festival and persuaded her to share some thoughts. We were joined by Jesse Roberts, one of the actors from Kate's very talented troupe, Not Cricket Productions. Kate, I was wondering if we could start out with a little bit of backstory about yourself, maybe describe where you're coming from, what you do, uh, what your background is in theatre, the, the whole big picture of you as a person. Oh gosh, yes, of course. Uh, so as a company, we've been coming up to the Fringe for, I think this is our eighth year up here, um, and recently we've been focusing a lot on social history, and that is quite related to sort of what I've been doing. So I'm, when I'm not doing theatre, um, I'm I'm an academic and a researcher, um, very much specialising in modern social history. So one of the things that I've really enjoyed pulling out of um, of my research is women's stories. So the last couple of years, what we've brought up to the fringe has focused on the stories of forgotten women. Um, so this year, it was Muriel Thompson, who is this um, wonderful, um, she was the first woman to win a, a racing championship in the UK. She went on to drive ambulances on the front line um, during the First World War. So she She's this wonderful character and I stumbled across her a couple of years ago and I've been really keen to bring her story to the front. So actually doing theatre like this is this a wonderful combination of sort of my research that I that I do when I'm not doing theatre and um, interesting work for the, the theatre company. So this show in particular is doubly in your wheelhouse, both as a... a, a a theatre person and as a researcher because it deals with your subject matter. Yes, definitely. And a lot of original research has gone into it. So um, Muriel kept a diary right the way through the the First World War and um, we've used extracts from that. Um, Some of them we've tweaked a little bit, but a lot of them are verbatim that have gone into the show. So it's got this real sense that links it to to who she is um, and what she had to say about the First World War. I'm going to thoroughly interrogate you about the show, so don't you worry. (laughs) But I will ask you at the moment, your production company, uh, Not Cricket Productions, which sounds like an expression that's been (laughs) yanked out of context perhaps uh yeah so it's a it's an idiom i suppose it uh, just uh, meaning that so, so when you say something's not cricket it's not on it's 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 a very sort of old-fashioned sort of 1930s phrase um and it just seemed to sort of go with the work we were producing so over the years we've produced we do a lot of classic storytelling um we we sometimes um touch on shakespeare we've done a few sort of rural tours with shakespeare and um, we've brought up classic kids shows before um And we like to tell sort of traditional stories and that very much fits in with what we've been doing recently as well. We are telling these stories and they're they're stories that are coming from history and they're stories that have have a resonance now so that's that's sort of our our sort of big picture for the theatre company and so the name ties in quite nicely with that it's got that traditional element to it and it's quite fun 
So it's a veteran theatre company and it sounds like you're also veterans of Edinburgh. Yeah, so um, yeah, we've been running as long as we've been coming up here. I think we started it the year before we first did Edinburgh, so probably nine years in total now. Um, And the first thing we did was The Tempest on a Beach in Scotland in April, which is very cold, um, but was... We really, we, we sort of put the theatre company together to do that and realised how much we were enjoying it. And we were a, stu- a student back then. Um, and really, since then, we've, we've really developed what we do. And it's gone on to become the semi-professional company that we have now. And Jesse, how long have you been affiliated with the company yourself? Uh, so this is my second year with Not Cricket. Yeah, I came up last year for the first time. And how did you get involved originally? So Not Cricket, York. So Kate started in St Andrews and then came to York and the people who she found in York were mostly history students and people in, in the drama societies and the pantomime societies. So I it's I was connected in the in the drama society. So yeah. But I'm a theatre student, not a history student, so that's a little bit different. Well let's talk about the show, A Gallant Life. You've already uh, spilled the beans a little bit about the subject matter. <laughs> you have talked about Muriel abstractly, but maybe just give us a give the listeners a rundown of the subject matter and some broad characteristics of the story. Absolutely. So uh, yep, yeah, it focuses on Muriel Thompson and it takes her through from nineteen oh eight to nineteen eighteen um, and follows her activities and her life during that period. Um, um, from winning this motor race um, and she wins a, several more after that um, which we sadly don't get to cover in the show uh, and then it takes her right up to sort of the last few months of the First World War and it follows her journey and her feelings about that and the people she meets along the way and the people she works with um, and particularly a big focus of the musical is on um, the, the unfortunately acronymed Fannies the First Aid Nursing Yeomanry who still exist today they're still a, a really great organisation that does a lot of response um, um, to things like terrorist attacks. They're involved in the logistics behind that and uh, answering the phone. So they're still very much a, a vibrant organisation. Um, but they were really interesting during the First World War. They were a group of very determined women who went out into a very male orientated environment and did amazing things um, against the will of the British Army in the first couple of years, who really didn't want them there. Uh, so it, it sort of looks at, at the, that group as well. Now, given that your mission is to explore forgotten or undiscovered women's stories, how did you come upon the story of Muriel? So I stumbled across her a, a few years ago, back in 1914. Uh, <laughs> Look good for uh, So uh, we were doing some monologues uh, relating to the centenary of the start of the First World War. And um, they, were, they were very sort of unrelentingly grim. And um, they... Somebody asked me if I would do one in the middle that was a little bit more upbeat. Um, But we really struggled to find uh, anything that related to women working during the First World War. Um, And I stumbled across the the Fanny website, um, which has some great archival material in it, and found Muriel's wonderfully sort of... Her voice is... She has a sense of comic timing to her writing. Um, she, She doesn't stint on the horrors that she sees, but she does have... A sense of humour, um, and so it was. It was perfect. So I, I did a chunk from her diaries as a monologue for this this performance, and uh, sort of got really attached to her, and went off and did a bit of research, got hold of the original copies of her diaries, and um, really sort of identified with her. And that is where the musical came from. Um, and it was really last summer after we we'd been doing a show about an early children's author called Angela Brazel, um, and sort of in the wake of that, we were talking about other stories, and Muriel Thompson came back to me. And so she seemed a great, a great option to pursue. And that's how we put together this fringe. One thing that struck me about the show was the historical authenticity of the dialogue. It felt very of the time. It felt very real. And it was rich with detail. How much of the dialogue in the musical was drawn from primary sources and Muriel's diaries? So there are a number of bits in the musical where Muriel sort of does diary entries she talks to the audience and presents diary entries and many of those are verbatim from her diaries Um, the dialogue itself that was all imagined around characters that we knew existed but those those diary entries where she that she does out front um 80 percent of those are straight out of her diaries um, and the others have been sort of tweaked to work around the 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 plot that we've put together i think you're burying the lead a little bit in that what impressed me was how all of the dialogue felt like it was coming from the same source. You did a very good job of Thank emulating you. her voice and dramatizing in a way that felt like it was storytelling. So, Thank you very much. That's I, nice to hear. <laughs> you had me fooled. So hats yeah. off. What struck me also as very interesting is that she was a race car champion, a female race car champion uh, in 19, I guess... 1908, 1908. She won her first race. So that's extraordinary for a couple of reasons, because who knows what car shape cars were in at the time. <laughs> 
Um, I just imagine them collapsing on the field because they're comparatively new technology. I actually have a picture of the car that she won the, the race in because, of course, it was so exciting that there was a women's car race and that she won it. It was on the front cover of the L- London Illustrated News from 1908, from the, the month that she won it. So we actually have a copy of the picture that she won the car in and it's a very stripped down um, version of those... I suppose those cars that you imagine as being early Edwardian, um, except they've just taken off, stripped off anything that gives you any protection whatsoever. So it's it's actually quite a streamlined vehicle, um, which was not how you think of cars of that period at all. Um, and it actually has a name. It was her brother Oscar's and it was called Pobble. Um, and later um, in the First World War, he did it up as an ambulance and he also was an ambulance driver. Um, and he t- took Pobble off to the front lines and drove ambulances as well. So to continue giving our listeners a broad overview of the story, uh, Muriel starts out with this unusual achievement as a driver, and she becomes interested in first the suffragette movement, and then in contributing to the war effort in some way, and what's natural for her is to be a driver. And she is spurned by the British Army. Yes. Uh, They don't take kindly to the idea of females on the front. But she finds a welcome uh, by the Belgian army, which was very hard-pressed, since that was the initial source of the fighting that kicked off the truly international nature of World War I. And then she has various adventures and incidents and suffers various hardships and pulls through. Yeah, very much so. That was a, a wonderful pricey of uh, of sort of the plot line. I'm trying not to give away any of the <laughs> no, key no, plot I think points. That was, I think that was pretty good without without hitting any of those big big plot points. Um, and actually, we when we develop it further, which we're hoping to do later, um, we're hoping to extend it and perhaps touch on some of those things a little bit more as well. Jesse, you play a number of parts in the show. Do you want to talk about some of those roles and how you differentiated them from one another? So, because... A lot of Not Cricket's work is very historically accurate. All of my characters had to have RP accents. So I found, as an actress, I found it quite difficult to differentiate my characters because my accent had to be the same um, because all of the people I played were from London. They were all, well, they were were all all very upper class. Yeah, they were all upper class people. Um, So, uh, but they are all real people. Um, um, Pethic Lawrence is the suffragette and she was a really amazing woman. Um, who Kate and I were talking about the other day. Um, and then I play a character called Franklin, who, again, is a real person, and she went on to, to become the... Common... Commandant? To become the commandant of the uh, the Fannies. And then uh, my character at the end is a lot of fun, but she's not a real character. She's a accumulation of lots of different uh, people to create a funny... Um, Kind of a distillation of different personality Yeah, because, again, the Fanny's uh, memories live on and they have relatives and it would be unfair to <laughs> victimise someone quite the way that we do Enid, so she's, she's not a real person. Um, um, but sort of tangentially based on someone, we came across a couple of references to an Enid who, uh, who was very young and was involved in the Fannies, who pulled through unexpectedly in a couple of incidents, um, who they have a lot of lovely things to say about. So we, we tweaked that as a little bit of a character and, and gave her a little bit more humour, which we thought was, was nice at that stage in the show. Well, even if you were adopting similar accents for each character, Mm. the body language of Enid must be very different from some of the other characters who are more senior in age. Yeah, so we also use signifiers in costume. So Enid has a big bow in her hair and she's a lot younger, so I was a lot more energetic and I gave myself a lisp that I'm still struggling to do, but I'm trying. Um, Whereas uh, Franklin, who went on to take over the fannies, um, I could use a much deeper voice and I had a cardigan, so I had a bit of a stoop and put my hands in my pockets more. Um, Yeah, and then um, the suffragette that I play had a massive hat on and a sash and it was very standing up straight and good posture. I remember, yeah. Yes. (laughs) So... What's interesting about Enid, uh, and perhaps this is one of the freedoms you get with a fictional character, is that she has an arc. Whereas the other characters are, they're all heroic, but they're relatively static. Uh, Muriel is just as an adventurer at the end as she was at the start. She has more uh, experience and she has a broader perspective, but she's kind of the same person, whereas Enid really grows. Yes. Um, it was. I think Enid's a very interesting look at how the war made people grow up. And it, it, she's a big example of people who would never expect to be in that situation being put in that situation because she was very upper class and thrown into caring for men in Belgium in the mud and um, how that made her grow and change as a person. 
Now, you were also director of the show. Yes. And you were dealing with a small and very versatile cast, but taking on a large number of roles. And this is obviously one example where the characters were often very different and actors were jumping back and forth in different roles. Mm -hmm. Uh, How did you manage just the logistics and then the the emotional uh, differentiation of all these different characters given a relatively intimate cast? Gosh, right. That's a big question. I guess Um, I'm asking, how do you direct? uh, So... Basically, we we looked at what each of those individual characters were and who they were, and, and, and yeah, we were talking about this. We have actually talked about some of sort of a greater history around them. We were having a long chat about Pethic Lawrence the other night and what she did beyond that that little scene um, with the the WSPU. Um, so people have an idea of how they they slot into the timeline and what they did and what they did around that, which I think helps you build that character um, and helps you have an awareness of, of what how that character would react to certain situations. Um, I mean, we have also, as Jesse said, we we've, we've got sort of costume signifiers for each character, and that involves some very fast changes. I imagine they yeah, they are backstage there doing incredibly fast changes. Um, so the logistics of those obviously had to be worked out as, uh, on a much more practical note, uh, but. We we tried to work on how they would look, how they would sound, um, and and sort of how they would react to things as well for the individual characters, just to make them as different as possible. You touched upon a really interesting point about the show, is that you're often getting these glimpses of people whose lives were fully developed, and you're seeing them whiz past at a certain point in their career, and... In order for that to be an authentic glimpse at someone, the actors really had to know what they were doing before that moment and where they were going so that the glimpse that we get still feels like it's on a believable trajectory. Absolutely. And this is this is the thing that I love. And this is what I was talking about earlier about sort of worlds colliding is that I have that research and I've done that research. And it's so exciting to be able to use it in something like this, even if the audience don't get to see it precisely. It means that we're really well informed um, and that sort of outside of the show, we can talk about it passionately as well, but it also informs performances within it. Very nice. Well, it worked uh, It worked extremely well in context. I really felt like I was getting this whirlwind tour of the period and getting glimpses of real people, and they weren't just captain number three. They, they were fleshed-out characters. So that, that was a real achievement, I think, of the, of the show. The story was rich with details, and one thing that stuck with me was when Muriel was struggling to keep the engines of her ambulances, I believe, warm by hand-cranking them, which is, I guess, what you did at the time, yeah. and it was freezing cold, and maybe they didn't have gloves, and that was such an interesting conflict, because it was so idiosyncratic to what she was doing. Were those details drawn from her biography? Uh, yes, so some of those I mentioned, so the bits where she talks about thawing the petrol filters, um, that bit was absolutely drawn from her diaries. Um, the also the bit when the car misfires, again, is something that she sort of casually mentions in one of her diaries. Um, but there are also a wonderful series of photos of the fannies. Um, and St. Omar, St. Omar wasn't the only the only ambulance convoy that the fannies were in charge of. They had um, dozens. Um, and obviously we're, with Muriel, we're getting sort of her specific experiences. But there are... The, there are photos from all of the convoys and there's snaps that they took themselves, but there's also a whole series of official photographs which were taken by war photographers, particularly in 1918, who, because women on the front line, once the British agreed to let them drive for them, were, were unusual and they were a real way of selling the war effort back home. Um, and they're all available through the National Library of Scotland, so you can get them all online. And they are a wonderful resource which adds a richness to what we know about it and there are pictures of them hand cranking the cars and there are pictures of them wearing these ridiculous fur coats because it's so cold that they actually need something over the top of their uniforms to stay warm in cars that have no real caps um so there is there is a wonderful amount of detail that we've been able to find which which gives us that um that fits in nicely with her diaries and i think it adds into that idea of us telling forgotten stories about forgotten people and that's lit, forgotten details within those stories. So you, I would never have thought about how they were actually starting the cars and the maintenance that they were doing on the ambulances. You just picture them driving them, but there's so much stuff that they have to do surrounding that. I think the details are part of what make a story engaging, because if we're trying to bond with some characters and that's the result of them struggling against something, to know really with great specificity what it is they're dealing with makes their struggle feel more real and it makes us connect to them better. And especially for a musical, that's, that's really key because that's part of the, the, the bond that we form with characters. 
On that subject, uh, it seems like this piece could have very easily have just been a straight play and it would have been very engaging. Where along the line did you make the decision to make it a musical? So very early on, actually, we've always had music in our plays, um, but I will confess this is the first musical we've done. Um, So we've always had that element of music and I really think it adds a lot to the storytelling that we do. Uh, And last year when we were discussing what we were going to do this year and talking about Muriel and how we were going to go with it, we took the decision that actually, because we'd had so much music incorporated in what we were doing, it'd be really nice to to write a musical. Um, And it was a story that lent itself well to that. So it was very early in the process. And I think, again, sort of as we look to develop it, we're hoping to underscore more of it and bring that music in more as well. The music credit primarily goes to Ross Telfer. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes, absolutely. Um, He has been involved with Not Cricket for years. He's been one of our actors um, and he is um, in London at the moment um, auditioning for all sorts of things, but he also still composes for us and has for the last couple of years. I got the sense, actually, let me pause. I like to, okay, and we're rolling again. I got the impression that stylistically the music felt at least influenced from the songs of the era. That's absolutely what we set out to do. So I'm really glad that's that's how you felt about it. We we really set out to produce music that sounded like it was appropriate for the period. Um, so a lot of the songs or a lot of the tunes have been tied in with things that were popular at the time or reflect those tunes. Um, so yeah, Ross wrote a lot of them. And then the two that he wasn't responsible for were The King Comes and the Australian song, um, which were developed by cast members. Those were a lot of fun. (laughs) What's interesting is that you have some songs that are what are called diegetic songs. They are meant to be songs in the show. They're literal songs, like I think Mm -hmm. there's a recruitment number. Mm -hmm. And then you have more musical theatery songs, which are getting inside the characters' heads, such as the opening number, where I think we're privy to Muriel's thoughts as she's driving. How did you decide where to put music and where not? So basically... um, it, it was sort of, again, as we developed it, um, we talked about nice places that, that songs would fit, things that would drive the plot forward as they do with something like The King Comes or the, the racing scene. Um, and then other songs, we, we realised, again, looking at music of the period, that we could slot it in really nicely with some of the wider themes that we were looking at. So I think it just depends on where we were in the story and, and who it was focusing on and, and where we were travelling with the plot at the time. Jess, I don't remember offhand if you were involved in any of the singing moments other than perhaps the group numbers. To what extent were you involved? <laughs> so this, this is a bit of a cast joke. I, I did have, um, I did sing a couple of songs, but I, di- I didn't get my own solo. Um, so when we develop it, we, uh, <laughs> we think we might give Enid, my fun character at the end, a bit of a, um, a, a bit of a starring moment in, because um, we, is it fair to say we start and finish with a, with an evening of celebration yeah, that the Fannings put on. Yeah. Um, so maybe letting Enid have her, her moment in that. Um, but yeah, Hannah and Kosi are the other actresses and they um, they wrote the songs that Kate just mentioned. Um, but I, I am less musical, so I just sing them. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Kosi particularly is a very talented musician. So she plays the piano and the guitar and the violin and all sorts of other things. Um, and Hannah's a great pianist. So um, yeah, they, they developed some of that music. But no, this is, <laughs> this is absolutely a joke. And we were, we were, again, as we look to extend it, uh, we promised Enid her own solo. <laughs> well, it makes sense because if you think that you've got a character who's got an arc and goes through some changes, that tends to be ripe for a song because mm-hmm. you want to know well what what caused that change is there a moment where she said i need to grow up yes uh, i see lives are at stake etc cetera, etc cetera. so that seems like a, a great direction for the for version two so um, i mean obviously with the with the fringe you're very constrained by time so we've had to i mean i think it runs about 54 minutes it's supposed to run 50 um so we've been we've had to really work to keep it very concise for the fringe but again as we hope to move forward with it we're hoping to extend it out a little bit and give ourselves a little bit more freedom to play with some of those things before i interrogate you about the future of the show uh, there are a couple of other things about the production that i thought were worth talking about one was the role of sound design which i thought was a real asset to the production and there were some moments that were absolutely brought to life because of sound design and the sense of being in a place and time um, who does your sound design and how early aboard were they involved in making some of those? So actually we did it. We're, we're a very tight knit company. We did most of it ourselves. Um, so the voiceovers were recorded by, again, another company member who hasn't been so involved this year, but has been regularly involved in the past. Um, and he actually does audiobooks. That's uh, what he does in, in other bits of his life. Um, so he recorded some of those for us. Um, and then on top of that, we sort of created them 
worked out what we needed as a company as the play developed and then put them together. Interesting. And there's there's one moment, I don't know if you want me to spoil it or not, but there's one use of shadow puppetry that oh, was yes. surprisingly powerful. Is that something you'd like to avoid speaking about or can we talk about it? I think we can talk about it. I think that's all right. So there's one moment in the show that was, for all its simplicity and implementation, really gave me the chills. And that is when Muriel et al. are in a, in a truck leading a convoy and they're spotted by, I guess, a German biplane. Yeah. And by the rules of war, the medical trucks are supposed to be exempt from gunfire, yeah. but it's dark and or the markings aren't clear. And they have this kind of north by northwesty scene where there's a, there's a plane coming. And the way this is implemented is, if I remember, it's both with sound design of the engines, but also the projection of a toy plane yeah. on a screen. So, so you're seeing the shadow. Literally just, it's a, it's a toy plane and a torch behind it. And it's very simple. But um, we've seen some really interesting works over the last few years at the Fringe who've used shadows. And we just thought it was such a nice idea. Um, and it works so well for that scene. And again, sort of moving forward, we're hoping to bring in some of that into the trench scene as well, where we, mm-hmm. the, there's an explosion at some point in the scene, uh, in the play. Um, and we're hoping to to bring in some of that in, in other areas of the production as well. Some of the constraints of Fringe, such as being in a small space or having not enough time, give rise to these interesting solutions. And sometimes they're, they're great in their own it's, right. It's actually great having to work to a really small black box space because you get so creative and you see other companies getting so creative with these spaces as well. And it, it's... In many ways, yeah, much as I'd love to do it on a much bigger stage with, um, you know, much more resources, doing something at the Fringe really makes you think about it and really makes you think about the staging and how you're going to do things and how you're going to portray things in the simplest manner possible. I think that's a real challenge and I think it's a really good thing for productions. Another example of this that leaps out of my memory is use of the aisle between the rows of seats as a trench Mm -hmm. where the characters were creeping down the aisle and that's a pretty good visual suggestion of a trench. So that's another case where it seems really primitive, but it worked very well. Uh, So you've been hinting at a future for the show. So I'd love to hear more about that. So we're hoping to, so as I said, it runs sort of 50, 54, 55 minutes at the moment. We're really hoping to extend it up to about an hour and a quarter. Um, That's that's the gold wave at the moment. Um, And really most of what we want to do with that is a couple of the songs we're looking to extend. But it's pick up the bits of character development that we've had to had to lose in in the time constraints so we're gonna give Enid a bit more um she's gonna get her solo but we're also going to I think we're going to write another song which actually looks at um Betty and Muriel and Enid and the, the sort of their fears within the context that they're in so actually a little bit more sort of personal thoughts than we've been able to to show in the current performance mm. uh so I think that's going to be quite interesting. And um, and then the ending is going to, to be extended slightly. Um, and there is a character that is talked about that we're hoping to extend his arc a little bit as well. So, um, yeah, there are there are sort of thoughts about how it's going to extend. And we're hoping to apply some, for some festivals early next year um, in which to show the, the, the extended version at. Oh, nice. So there are other festivals that are less constrained in terms of time slots. Yes, absolutely. So the one we're definitely looking at is the Vaults Festival, which if they're listening to this, we would love a slot uh, in the spring. Um, so that's that's one of the big ones. That's in London. Some stuff goes there before coming up to Edinburgh and then some stuff sort of goes there afterwards, but they get some really interesting performances. So that's, that's one of the aims. But I've also been talking to you um, some people about some of the history festivals there are, um, and there's a couple over the summer, so we might look at putting it in for some of those as well. Is this the main item on your creative agenda for the future, or are you working on any other shows? Uh, so this is the main one at the moment. Um, there have been some ideas thrown around. We, we often find that we're developing shows for the following year um, at, at the Fringe because there's this wonderful creative melting pot. We go out and see things, and we come back and we say, oh, there was this amazing thing we saw. Could we do something that relates in this way, or could we? So there's a few other things we're talking about at the moment. Um, in terms of women's stories, we're looking at... Um, something that might relate to women in theatre and the stories of um, actresses um, over time, which, again, is something that's not been clearly told um, on stage. So that that's an option. Um, and, um, yes, we, we have some, some other less serious ideas floating about, <laughs> also relating to women in history. Um, so there are other things potentially in development, but nothing that's moved forward very far at the moment. Got it. And Jesse, you said you're still a student at the moment. Yes. So what's your pipeline look like educationally and when do you spring free from university? So I'm going into my third year 
Um, so just hearing Kate talk about what we're doing next year is a bit like, ah. Oh. Um, <laughs> but yes, so I, I'm hoping to stay with the company as long as I can. Um, yeah, I, I am hoping to go into theatre. But we'll, we'll see what happens next year. I think you're in theatre. <laughs> well, yes, yes. Go into theatre more. Um, yes. Full, full time? <laughs> full time, full time. There we go. What we do as a company is really nice because it it's not slap bang in the middle because, I mean, it's definitely a musical, but it's, um, it's not the kind of musicals that are being made at the moment that are um, uh, sort of Jason Robert Brown... Uh, talking as you're singing, it's they're not like that. They're they're more traditional. There's there's a spectrum you can think of between book musical and what's sometimes called play with music. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this sits, I think, somewhere in the middle of those yeah. two, because the criteria for play with music is if you yank out all the songs, is the play still fine? Yeah. And that's clearly not the case here because yeah. there are a couple of important emotional beats. Mm-hmm. But the songs are a little sparser than you'd have in a traditional book musical. Yeah. So it's somewhere on the spectrum there. So I guess I'm just repeating what you said less <laughs> well, but that seems to be a consensus. <laughs> uh, cool. Well, it sounds like you've got your work cut out for you for the next uh, year or two. Are you are you London based? Um, so we're all over now. Um, obviously, we all met in New York, or sort of uh, much many of the current team met in New York. Um, but gosh, we're all over. Um, we've got a lot of people in London. Jesse's still in York. Um, we've got, we've got a couple of cast members who live in Edinburgh now. So we are sort of scattered to the four winds. Um, but we do try to come together regularly and do things and continue to work together because we're such a good team and it's it's a really nice sort of intimate little company. It's nice that you're able to maintain that camaraderie and the continuity of working together despite being yeah, flung to the all, winds. All over the place, yeah. I mean, it's not that big a country, but still. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's quite small. Fun. Nothing is more than a few yeah. hours away. Well, that must be nice. For listeners who are intrigued and would like to learn more about the show or perhaps follow you individually as artists, where can they go online? So we've got a website, um, which is, if you Google Not Cricket Productions, it'll pop up, but it's actually www.simplyspiffing.co.uk to pick up another ridiculous British phrase. Um, we're also at Simply Spiffing on Twitter. And if you pop on there, you'll find all of us individually as well. Um, and we're also on Facebook under Not Cricket Productions. That's great. And Jesse, just as an artist, do you have your own corner of the web or anything you want to plug or do you want people to follow you on Twitter? You can follow my Twitter and my Instagram if you want. <laughs> Um, my Instagram is Jesse Roberts with two S's and my Twitter is Jesse Claire 15. Um, <laughs> nice. Well, you may, you may pick up fans. <laughs> I, I hope so. so. Well, thank you both so much. I wish you the best fortune with the remainder of your French run. Thank you very much. For more information about Musical Talk, please visit our website at musicaltalk.co.uk. You can email us at feedback at musicaltalk.co.uk, listen to past episodes on iTunes and YouTube, and follow our social media channels on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Music